All right, guys, continuing on with uh, the period six, uh, I was talking about nativism earlier. Um, here's the characteristics of it during this period. Okay, first of all, nativi nativists are people that are opposed to immigrants coming in. It doesn't matter what time period or where they're coming from, but normally it's going to tie around the following factors. Number one, it's going to be they're opposed to these people because of a different religion. Now, in the case of the immigrants that came from Southern and Eastern Europe, they are Catholic, and that's going to come in opposition, or it's going to be opposed to uh, the typically Protestant uh, religious um, aspect of Americans who were previously here. Uh, there's going to be different languages. There's going to be a loss of jobs. There's a lot of factors that tie into it and you need to be able to tie these into each of the waves of immigration that we talked about. Alright, so out of all this industrialization, remember immigration, all these things tie into it. Um, there's another, uh, there's a couple of theories that come into this, justifications and oppositions for it. Uh, supporters of this new industrial order are more often than not going to tie them in, themselves into the uh, theory of social Darwinism, which comes out of Darwinist um, origin of species or evolution or whatever it is. In other words, the bottom line on it is what these people are saying is that these people are in these jobs because that's just the way society works. Like there's nothing to be done about it. There's a place for these people and they're filling in, I guess you could say, their natural order. They're where they're supposed to be. Now, on the flip side of that, you have some reformers uh, who come into play <clears throat> with regards to the way workers are being treated and stuff like that. One of the most vocal being Andrew Carnegie, who was, as you know, uh, one of the richest men in America at this time from his factories that he owned. Uh, and he comes out with his gospel of wealth, in which he talks about the responsibility of people who have a lot of money, people who have been very fortunate, uh, with what they have done and um, how they need to give back, how they need to give back to society, like it is the responsibility of the wealthy people. And then you have the social gospel in which people took it, a religious slant on it and said it was the responsibility of the churches uh, to go out and, and help these people who were struggling due to bad working conditions, lack of pay, that kind of stuff. All right, guys, I'm going to take a second and jump away from the review book a little bit and just talk about the West in general um, because I feel like it's a topic that needs to be covered that for whatever reason is lacking. So just bear with me for a second and fill in the blanks where you can or, or take notes where you can. All right, so one of the major components that ties into the expansion into the West and the the preceding or the, the resulting population uh, and migration movement to the West is the Transcontinental Railroad. Now, you need to be aware, uh, number one, that it ties the East and West together. Uh, the Union Pacific and Central Pacific, I uh, talked about this earlier, with the railroads in charge of building it. And the labor that they used to build it was, uh, most of the labor was provided by immigrants. And um, in the case of uh, the Central Pacific, I believe, yes, yeah, Central Pacific, uh, a majority of the workers were Irish, okay, and uh, you need to know that they were called paddies, uh, and that the, the main difficulty, the main uh, hazard to their, their form of work, to what they were doing, uh, was the tax from natives, because they were going into areas that hadn't necessarily been settled. Now, in opposition to them, on the other side, you have the Chinese laborers who were working on the point of the railroad from west to east, uh, from Sacramento to, um, to Utah. Uh, they were known as coolies, uh, C-O-O-L-I-E-S, and um, the main difficulty that they had was just the pure geography they had to overcome to build this railroad. They're going through the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, they're going <coughs> into some very inhospitable uh, climate and geographic regions of the United States. Now, as far as the consequences of this railroad, well, as, you know, population moves in and stuff like that, you see the near extinction of the buffalo and a complete changing of Native American life because uh, they're their society rested or, or relied on the buffalo to such a large extent that it almost collapsed after uh, so many of them were killed. Uh, also, you see tons of western migration out of this because for the first time, people have a direct access route to get to the west. One of the things you need to be aware of when it comes to the uh, Transcontinental Railroad is the effect that it had on the people who were already there. And those, those people were known as the Plains Indians. Um, I've already talked about the buffalo and the loss of it and how it impacted their lives. Remember, these guys used buffaloes from everything from uh, meat to using the hides to make tents to clothing to trinkets to trade goods to whatever it was. Like Their, their way of life was predicated on the fact that the buffalo was there. And as it becomes near extinct, uh, it severely impacts what they can do. Uh, also, with the introduction of Americans into uh, their regions, you see the introduction of disease, uh, such as smallpox and other things, but they're, they're diseases that they've never built up a natural immunity to. So, as whites and as Americans move into these regions, um, you see a drop in the population. And then, obviously, uh, out of this comes a change in the economy. They begin to trade more and more. Um, you see a more reliance uh, shifting to them um, you know, relying more on trade with whites, with Americans, than, uh, than anything else. Uh, one of the works of, uh, of American um, 
writers you need to be aware of during this period as regards to the West is A Century of Dishonor by Helen Hunt Jackson, in which she came out and she basically talked about how uh, Americans were betraying Indians by going into their lands, or betrayal of natives by going into their lands and um, disrupting their way of life in a way that hasn't been seen really in these uh, in native populations since the Columbian Exchange. Uh, another component of westward expansion is the Dawes Act, uh, which basically set out to assimilate Indians, to make them more American, I guess is the best way to put it. In other words, to teach them religion, uh, the way our government works, our culture, and stuff like that, and by consequence of this, be able to integrate them more easily into American society and have them get along with and, um, and work with uh, the people who were settling out west. Another work you need to be aware of that is that was in response to this westward migration uh, is the significance of the frontier in American history, which you'll probably see referred to as the Turner Thesis. And it talked about how uh, we need a frontier to keep the greatness of America going. We need somewhere to constantly be striving for it. And we were starting to lose that by this westward expansion. Uh, and there were questions about whether we could continue on as a great nation. All right, so now we pick back up with the review book with a section on agrarian discontent, or to put it another way, farmers being mad at everything. And there's several causes for this. Number one, we talked about all these in class way back when. But uh, it's going to boil down to economic problems for farmers, and one of these is going to be discriminatory shipping rates, or as we worded it in class, long haul, short haul shipping rates. In other words, it's just un they perceive it as being unfair. They're paying too much for what they're doing. They're being charged unfair rates. Uh, another one is going to be high tariffs uh, that are happening. Uh, that's going to, uh, you know, it just all boils down to them making less money, and then a deflationary money monetary policy and the high cost of inputs, all combining to put them. Uh, in a cycle of debt. They're not making enough money to pay off the debts they accrue trying to put a crop in. So these problems uh, are going to manifest themselves later in the formation of an actual political party. And that party is going to be called the Populist Party, which comes out of a social group that was formed in the Midwest by farmers called the Grange, where they would basically get together and talk about the problems they were having and bounce around ideas of how to solve them and stuff like that. Well, eventually enough people get involved, it becomes an organized movement, then a political party. And as the uh, populist party comes about, they have to establish a platform or what they're going to try to do if they um, can get power, if they control the country. And, and it's basically what they want to do uh, if elected. And it boils down to, number one, increasing the money supply so farmers have better access to credit. Uh, they want to regulate railroads to get rid of uh, the long haul, short haul practices and other unfair practices they saw. And then also uh, a characteristic of it is they elected or they nominated William Jennings Bryan to be their pre their uh, candidate for president in 1898. And uh, hopefully you can tell this from this cartoon, but if you see this, you need to be able to associate it with the cross of gold speech uh, that McKinley made that we'll talk about in class. All right, so the populists make a little dent and they get their message out, but in the end, they don't really make that much of an impact. But uh, they, there's a couple of reasons why this happened. Number one is sectionalism. I mean, even though we fought the Civil War, there's still competing interests and differences between the North, South, and West of this country. And um, it's impossible to take the message of the populists and apply it to, for instance, someone who is a merchant or a banker or whatever it is in the North or anything like that. So they couldn't get, like, wide... Um, they couldn't really get wide appeal for their message. Uh, number two, uh, there's a little um, there's a little bit of underlying racism within uh, the populist party and the fact that black farmers and white farmers would not work together towards common goals. <clears throat> also, uh, urbanization plays into it. More and more people are moving into cities, and uh, farm concerns become less and less of a problem as the population of the country moves more and more to urban centers. And then the discovery of gold. Uh, leads to a natural increase in the money supply. Remember, we're still basically on a gold and silver or hard currency standard. So some of the problems that farmers were had uh, were having uh, kind of go away. So there's not as much urgency to, uh, to devote uh, time and energy to the cause. All right, that wraps up period six, guys. We're going to roll to period seven in the next one. And uh, for online purposes, we've got two more left, period seven and period eight.